Um, basically, my art is about a lot about childhood and growing up because me and my family weren't the most like um, fortunate. We had we went through a lot of hardships growing up, and so finding something that I enjoy doing was like kind of tough. So drawing for me was like an escape from all of the um, hardships growing up. And I first started drawing by looking through my mom's tattoo book and I would copy the images and I would be so excited to show her. And as soon as like, I don't know, just like after I created a work of art, I got this feeling that I really can't explain except like it was just like, I don't know, it was just amazing. And um, so I just like growing up, I drew a lot, like in high school, I um, I guess in high school, that's where I really um, started taking it serious because I don't know, I was really into surrealism back then. And then, so I would like draw these cartoons of like parallel universes and my teacher was really like, I don't know, she, she liked them and she like, I don't know, she, she gave me like a good uh, reaction, I guess. And um, so I guess by her seeing something in my work that I didn't necessarily see that really made me stick to um, drawing. And I don't know, the more I drew, the more I got more in tune with it and then just wanted to make it more of a career. But it's more of a passion of mine because I just spent hours drawing. Um, this body of work here is really just um, kind of like representing my family. Right here is a self-portrait of me. And um, I'm really interested in the whole like um, outsider art artists and like the whole um, and that whole movement of like Jean Dufay and uh, who else? Paul Clay, I think. I'm not sure. But so these pieces were inspired by like the techniques that they would use and I don't know, I, I like to use a lot of techniques from old painters and incorporate it into my own kind of work. And um, yeah, the, I don't know, I guess like the hardest part about drawing now is like trying to talk about it. But I, I think more, the more I draw, the more I connect my pieces to like me growing up and finding more like just trying to connect my childhood more into my work. That's kind of like what my goal is. And my goal is to just be a successful artist. And that's kind of it. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jordan Caldwell. Uh, I'm 24. Uh, I've lived in Albuquerque most of my life. And uh, basically the type of art I do is I do uh, pretty traditional oil on landscape paintings. Uh, I make very large paintings. I make them by myself. Uh, the whole process, I, I get the wood, I cut it, I put everything together and I control the size of my art. Uh, to start with my inspiration, uh, my primary painter inspiration is uh, Edward Hopper. If you've ever seen his work, uh, his most famous painting, uh, Nighthawks, that's my favorite painting. Uh, and how he would, I was inspired by how he would capture the life around him at the time uh, during the World War II and the post-war America, uh, especially in Central America. And uh, uh, I'm also very inspired by music. Uh, I feel very inspired by uh, jazz, city pop things, very instrumental orchestral things uh, I very relate to. Uh, so the meaning of my art is I want to capture the beauty of the mundane in the world we live in today. So I do that through the romanticization of the world around us, uh, very saturated colors, high contrast landscapes. And the point of that is to show appreciation for the life that we live, no matter what it is, that even the most simple life can be appreciated and is that no, there's nothing wasted about the life you live. 
uh, actually, I guess that's that's all about that's about all I have to say. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Bridie Carmagno. Um, so for my my work is a lot of the times focused on um, bodies and the way um, our bodies kind of move around the world, the way we present ourselves to um, other people. I think about that kind of stuff a lot. Um, I'm, I mostly work with photography also, I should say. Um, I'm primarily a photographer, but I like to dip my toes in other things too sometimes. Um, but my work is focused on like the idea of having a body and how we present ourselves to the world. And I find myself thinking a lot about like how I present myself um, online versus like in person, how I'm perceived online versus in person, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, and this um, project kind of specifically um, is focusing around uh, my struggles with body dysmorphia um, and kind of the way it's distorted the way I view my body and the way I kind of move around the world. Um, it's kind of a constant, I'm very aware of the way I, I present all the time. Um, so I kind of like to just say that this project is like a practice for me to um, come to terms with the fact that I have to have a body. Um, uh, so it kind of, it's been um, ongoing for a few months now and my first kind of phase, I guess, were these um, heavily Photoshopped self-portraits of, my, of myself. Um, and I was just kind of trying to think about how unrecognizable I feel um, to myself. Uh, I don't ever really feel like I recognize myself in an image and never really feel as though I'm looking the same as how I think I look, um, all of that, all of those kinds of ideas. Um, and so that was kind of what I was going for with these. Um, my next kind of phase, I guess, uh, for the project are, well, I was thinking more about the um, idea of completely distorting my body um, to the point of being unrecognizable. So it's the, I took Polaroids of myself. Um, um, I think they're, they're the ones that are like a, a little more distorted and stuff um, like this one. Um, I took Polaroids of myself and then dragged them along a scanner um, to try to just make it so I couldn't really recognize parts of my body um, because that's just kind of something I deal with and I wanted to express that um, how I I never feel like I never feel as though I can be recognized and this was just a way to fully abstract my body um, and yeah and I still don't really know why. I have a body or anybody does. So if any of you have any answers, please let me know. Um, but yeah, that's about, that's about it for me. I'll pass it on to Harley. Hi, I'm Harley Kirshner um, and I'm a mixed media artist, um, primarily working in uh, Found, on found objects using reflective materials such as gold leaf and um, mirrors and questioning what it means to have a body inside of a space, uh, inside of a space such as um, in this first picture, uh, is a tabletop, so like, what do, what is a table for? Um, that it, and also this being the only piece in the show that is open. Um, what does it mean to have closed doors um, and kind of hidden messages? Um, I don't really paint on things that don't have a message. Uh, my healing cabinet um, uh, is, as well as the, um, the next piece that you'll see um, look out the window, are pieces that serve as kind of models for space as art. So this is a small piece that I have created to interact with 
inside of an, an immersive piece. Um, and if you look on YouTube, you can find uh, the immersive healing cabinet, um, which contains all of these works um, as installation. Um, I am most inspired by both ugly things and like the patina that has become beautiful um, and, and really warping things that have value um, as well as really beautiful and how the ugly makes things more beautiful and the beautiful makes things more ugly. Um, and yeah, I am also looking for models. So if you check out my website, which I, or sorry, if you check out my Facebook, um, you can, I'm, I'm looking for trans and non-binary models for work that goes along with the work that's in this show. And if you do go to this show in person, please be sure to check out the back of the mirror because I think that it's a little bit hard to know, but there is more to that work. Um, so make sure you see all sides. So my name is Adrian Martin. Um, I live in Albuquerque. I'm originally from New Mexico. I uh, grew up in Silver City. Um, I went to UNM where I got a BFA in uh, 2010. Um, the BFA was in photography, but at the same time, I also did some kind of mixed media stuff. Um, after school, I ended up being uh, mostly a wedding photographer and a um, product photographer, stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, I like started selling things online so that I had some place to put my uh, non-photo work. Um, I'm not super big on you know like exact explanations of what everything means or where it comes from. Uh, my kind of philosophy is that, you know, these things are meant to go out in the world and they're, you know, they're supposed to be separate from me, so they should kind of have a life of their own. Um, but, you know, I, I think philosophically, I guess I just, uh, well, I want to make things that don't necessarily waste people's time. You know, they feel respected by the you know, the level of work I've put into it so that they, you know, they might not have a positive reaction necessarily, but they don't feel frustrated by the fact that, you know, they didn't get anything, any sort of experience. Um, it's quite hard to tell in these photos uh, how large things are. Um, so I have props. So these eyes and the, the bolo tie are also, they're basically, about the size of like a human eye. So maybe like 90% of regular person sized. Um, the worm balls, the three ones, uh, that, those are like about the size of a baseball, like handheld. <laughs> um, and then there's one that's by itself in the photo and it looks very similar to the, the three all in a row but it's actually quite large. This is obviously unfinished, but it's an armature for a similar one that is about the same size, uh, which is like about the size of your head. <laughs> um, I should probably say that uh, if you look for me online, there's not a lot of stuff under my actual name. Uh, online, I go by some rabbits, as in there's some rabbits over there. Um, so yeah, if you look up some rabbits on Etsy or Instagram or, somerabbits.com, something like that. Um, that's where you would find me. Um. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, my name is Madison McClintock, and I'm a filmmaker and textile artist. And I have a background in documentary, uh, mostly natural history, conservation, environmental ad advocacy, and um, celebrating and preserving folk art traditions. But um, lately I've been thinking a lot about why I got into film in the first place. And that has to do with film being a really unique medium and having its own language. So, um, you know, the, the tools and techniques that are in film, you have this multi-dimensional space where you can work with color and composition and music and, 
and sound and create this space where you can allow audiences to come to their own conclusions about things. And um, documentary sometimes falls short of that. So I've sort of been coming back to wanting to explore these basics of film. And um, so the piece that I have here kind of does, does that. And um, something I've also realized recently is this sort of through line through all my work has to do with um, encouraging people to come back into union and back into um, relationship with the natural world and um, realizing that our existence is really reliant on having a symbiotic relationship with the non-human world. So um, creating a space, whether that's through film or with textiles or what, um, where people can explore this topic. Um, and if you know they become in relationship, then maybe they'll care. And if they care, they'll be um, encouraged to act on its behalf. So I think it's kind of a, an audacious goal, but I, I see that coming through a lot in my work. So um, the film I have here is called Metallic Silk and it investigates this idea um, through the production of silk. And so I filmed um, at this silk farm and um, production, silk production house in Laos in Southeast Asia. And it kind of goes through the life cycle of the silkworm and then the relationship that people have with, with um, nurturing that, that, like that process and then taking the, the cocoons and then turning them into this precious item that is silk. So um, yeah, that's my work and thank you for listening. Hi, uh, my name is Kate Overton Miller and I'm really glad and honored to be a part of this exhibition, um, but also probably even more so to like be amongst this cohort of artists in the community of Harwood. Um, these, these are my photographs. So uh, a common question that I get is, are these photoshopped? Um, and what people are asking me in this is, are they composite images? Um, and while I do use Photoshop to like finalize edits in my photos, um, these are old family photographs um, that are sharing time and space with flora and fauna and poetry. Um, and it's important to me that you know that they are together in this um, as I explain my work. Um, so it may come as a shock to you, but photographs can never be the moment or the thing which they, de they depict. They're literally some sort of translation of light on a substrate or sensor, but can never be your dog, your wedding day, or other things we strive to preserve in our futile photographing. In this way, a photograph grieves the death of the thing that they depict. They remind us that what they appear to be is no longer. And I found that shells live a similar life, or rather die a similar death, um, something used to reside in those calcium carbonate dwellings, but is no longer. And yet we look for life there in the way we obsessively collect them when we visit beaches. Um, photographs and shells are grasping for life and memento moris um, or death objects. So now that I've used up most of my time and set the scene of this bleak reality, let me share that I have found that there are ways to find preservation and even life in these death objects. In the intuitive making of these scenes, the ones that are um, being shown right now, I ask, how does this family photograph exist today? How does it breathe? I let slugs leave shimmering trails across the surface, roly pulleys run rampant, and meaningful words replace the forgotten wallpaper of my childhood home. My hope for these forgotten family photos is that these collected specimens of flora and fauna shuffle around like little hermit crabs to bring new residents and life in these photographic shells. In some ways, I feel that they are successful, but in other ways, I feel like they just die a second death. And I still grapple with the success of this and the choice of re-photographing them, but time does not allow me to get that meta tonight. I'll end with this. In my practice and the many appendages of exploring this obsession of living and dying as a photograph, I have learned that photography lives in a sort of symbiosis with the push of and pull of death, preservation, and sometimes even life. There's a season for it all under the sun. And ultimately, my hope is to steward um, this work living in a poetic and whimsical humor with roots and in intuitive play. And my heart is to offer these tiny worlds for erratic thought, a good laugh, precious holding, and inevitable decay. <sighs>
So I am a, my name is Hannah Ramage. I'm a figure painter challenging standards of beauty and the ideal, which uh, I love how these threads kind of run through so many different artists. Um, there's lots of self portraits here. Uh, my childhood had a lot of stark gender roles. Um, and so my color palettes reflect that. Uh, when I think about what colors I wanna use in one of these paintings, I think about the very gendered toys and furnishings of that confined ladylike girl I was supposed to be. Um, I also love using highly saturated darks that complement the pastels and create kind of an uncomfortable space. Um, the, my figures inhabit a psychological environment that I want to be at the same time pretty and unsettling um, because when I was, I was raised with this idea that prettiness is value and it, that's you know, a very troubling way to look at the world and at people. Um, and so that unsettling, uncomfortable nature of the color schemes that I use is very important to me in conveying that um, prettiness is never all that's going on in an object or a person. So in this pastel landscape, I ask questions about femininity and masculinity, uh, questions like, why do we sustain these fictional ideals? Uh, why do we want people to be polarized into strict categories? And what is threatening about the identity of others? Um, so in my surface painting specifically, the figure is a storyteller. Um, sometimes from my life, sometimes my family or friends, but usually just a moment. Um, I love the futility of trying to capture a moment similar to what Kate just spoke about. In the painting, Watching Football, um, my partner, Steven, is wearing my grandmother's nightgown, which is a pretty precious artifact from my childhood and filled with memories, all good ones. And Steven and I moved into my childhood home. Um, it was basically a hoarder home filled with the belongings of my mother who had died of ALS and my father who nearly died working full time at the same time being her primary caregiver. Um, so there was this aggressive collision of past and present and uh, cleaning out the home felt like an archeological dig of my own history and my family, often bringing up painful memories and um, all things that I had to confront and deal with. So just like Steven, in the painting, trying to watch a game um, while I'm annoyingly, you know, painting him and taking photos and asking him to wear a dress for the first time. Um, we were forced to adapt and become comfortable in the unfamiliar. In my other painting in this presentation, Teacup One, um, it's a painting of me presenting a porcelain teacup in my first nude self-portrait. Uh, this teacup series also began in the excavation of my childhood home and my psyche, to be, to be honest. There was a lot of personal things going on. Um, I found a set of pristine porcelain teacups uh, and they were flawless, delicate, perfect. Um, they've never been used. I cannot remember a single time in my entire childhood when those teacups were used. And um, growing up, honestly, I wanted to be that teacup. I would have given anything to feel that I was perfect instead of the like ramshackle pile of mistakes and imperfections that I felt like. Um, but then, you know, really what was wrong wasn't the things I perceived as flaws. It was the way I was seeing myself trying to live up to a standard that could never possibly be attained and wouldn't be useful. You know, that teacup was useless. So I now look for beauty and utility, strength of character, and not in the flawless gleam of a never used object. Um, this painting represents my recovery from disordered thinking and self-image and moving beyond a childhood of control. So together, these two paintings depict a journey from control to agency and from fear to adaptation and growth. And um, I'm so grateful to have been a part of this show with all of these skilled and inspiring young artists, young in different ways, but all of our art is young, I'd say. Um, and thank you so much for including um, me. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to the Harwood and Julia and Jordan and Helen and congrats to everybody. I'm Lauren Dana Smith and I am originally from Brooklyn, New York. 
but I am here in Taos, New Mexico, where I live on the Mesa. And you can see maybe a little bit of that behind me in my studio. And the two pieces that are part of this show are part of a series of, of paintings um, that I started during quarantine in New York last year while I was simultaneously painting in my home studio and working in a large city hospital as a mental health care worker with COVID patients. So I'm in a new chapter here in New Mexico, thankfully, and I have a lot of time to paint and a lot of time to be in the studio. And what I've been working on and really interested in is this intersection of art and the creative process and healing. And I think that's always present in my work, no matter what the content. These two works are inquiries into the parallel between body and the land. And I think that they fall somewhere between abstract figurative and abstracted landscape. And I'm curious about and sensitive to the psychology of the land and body, both in an individual way and in a collective sense. And in particular, because I've worked in some of the most intimate of medical settings, such as in an end of life unit or in an intensive care unit or in pediatrics. And so I work with the intimacy of human experience and it's reflected in these, these two pieces, um, especially in these pod-like features in both paintings. Um, some people have described them like cells, like cell-like structures, I like that. They've emerged and I think they also reflect this interest that I have in what we hold to be true in our human experience compared with what environments hold for us, whether they're geographical or emotional or relational. And my painting process itself is similarly embodied. So in my practice as an art therapist, I frequently used plaster to cast the molds of the hands of my patients and families that I worked with as part of a legacy experience. Um, and now, and I have one behind me kind of in progress, you can see I build the canvases and frames themselves out with wood that I cut my hand into a contoured live edge. And then I apply a lot of layers of plaster and textural media to develop a unique topography for each piece that emerges and it emerges through the process itself. So thank you so much everyone for Hello. being here. Hi everybody, my name is Daisy Chadell Mills. I am from Mora, New Mexico. And um, I just wanna say I'm so honored to be here with all these amazing artists. And um, yeah, so thanks Harwood. Thank you to the other artists and thank you to everybody for being here today. Um, so both of my parents are artists. My grandmother is an artist. And um, from a young age, I was always like really interested in art and um, being creative. Um, so <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I guess like I was always just kind of living in my imagination and creating something. Um, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 after going to an art school and being very interested in art all my life. Um, and I entered this GED program called Youth Build. So shout out to Youth Build for real. Um, they taught me a bunch of construction skills, helped me get my GED and really like helped me realize my passion for installation and sculpture. Um, so yeah, when I was in high school, I didn't really see myself going to college until um, kind of like Thomas. I had a teacher who believed in me when I was in youth build and that's what motivated me to go to college. Um, so when I was in college, my first semester, I made this sculpture. Um, it was my first cast piece um, or metal piece. And um, yeah, a common theme in my work throughout undergrad was these like androgynous um, kind of alien-esque forms like in repose. And um, I was making these as like a, exploration of my grief and um, just like rest, I guess, like what it means to be at rest, whether that means like sleep, um, me meditation, death, or just like somewhere in between those. Um, this is a lost wax bronze casting. So I sculpted it out of oil clay initially. Um, 
And then I made a mold of it using polyurethane and plaster. Um, and yeah, so that's that piece. And then for these two drawings, I made them last year in September. I hand drew these in pen and in color pencil. Um, while making these and currently in my artistic practice, I'm exploring this like coexistence of emotions like grief and joy and pain and pleasure. Um, the body in Kimbaku and really like bondage in general uh, is for me like a symbol of pleasure and pain and um, like the pain and pleasure and the pleasure and pain. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, like as a marginalized person, the pain in life is kind of inevitable. So I'm currently really driven by highlighting this like pleasure part of it. And I'm doing that by exploring themes of romance, um, sensuality and eroticism. And um, botanicals show up a lot in my work just because like, you know, the human body is so floral to me. Um, and yeah, that's my, that's my thing. Thank you so much for sharing so bravely and openly with us today and in your work at large. Um, something always happens each year that we can't foresee with the applicants to the surface show, which is that this kind of like universal coalescence happens and it, uh, a kind of thematic thread appears. And in the past years, that has maybe been a palette or a feeling more than um, an aesthetic manifestation. And something that was so extraordinary about this year is that really, which a lot of you, of course, spoke to in your work about your work is that it ended up being really a portrait show and a show honoring the human experience and the human identity and the beauties and brutalities of occupying these bodies. And that feels so resonant and timely for now, lest not because something else happened this year, which is for the first time categorically, Every artist who was accepted to this program in their in their confirmation emails back to us, almost before saying yes, said, I'm so excited to meet the other artists in this group. And we just, Helen and Jordan and I have spent a lot of time reflecting on how powerful that is and how important that is in this time. And we appreciate your willingness, all of you individually, to name that and to to celebrate that and to honor that with your work. And, um, and it gives us a lot of hope for what is ahead and what can come out of community spaces and individual voices and artistic vision. And we thank you again so much for all of that. And, um, and again, wanna sit, congratulate all of you for your acceptance and awards as Surface Emerging Artists of New Mexico. And now Helen will share with you the named endowed awards and then we will hear Nate's solo talk. So thank you all so much. Um, Thank you, Julia. And as you were saying, um, each year we're just blown away by the depth of talent and creativity and voice that the surface cohort presents. And it just reminds us that um, the creative community of New Mexico is just like this ever bubbling well. Um, so in, in addition to receiving the surface emerging artist award and honorarium and participating in our professional development and exhibition program, um, artists juried into the exhibition are eligible to win additional endowed cash awards. This year's awards are as follows. The Reggie Gammon Award is presented to painter H.E. Rumaj. The recipient of the Megan Ferguson Award um, is Harley Krishner. And the Marion and Catherine Christie Award is presented to Jordan Caldwell. And the, reci the recipient of the Valerie Roybal Award is Madison McClintock. 
And the Harwood Solo Exhibition Award is presented annually for artistic excellence, originality of vision, and dedication to practice. And it culminates with a show concurrent to surface in the following year. We are delighted to award this opportunity to Thomas Bowers. And we're just looking forward to see what you create next year. And um, you can, as we've said before, you can visit the exhibition by making an appointment on our website and you can see it virtually there. And you can also get connected with all of these artists with their um, own websites and social media to see other works and um, creative projects they have going on. And so for our last talk, I am just so excited to um, introduce Nate Lemuel, whose solo exhibition, Beyond the Future, is currently in our hall gallery. gallery. So here's Nate. Hello, everybody. Yat e she e Nate Lemuel in she Torecini e nishe Kitlecini e Bashishin Ashkanzo e Dashiche Tachini e Dashanella. Hello, my name is Nate Lemuel. I am of the Bitterwater clan. I am born of the Red House People clan. Yucca strung yucca fruit strung out in the line clan are my maternal grandfathers, and red running into the water people clan are my my paternal grandmothers. Um, so it's been a crazy, um, it's been a crazy pandemic. Um, am I, am I, am I muted? Let's see, can anybody hear me? Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, how should I start out? Um, I've been photographing since I was young. I picked up a camera uh, at a young age, um, film camera and it kind of just started out from there from family trips to um you know my grandmother's sheep camp on here on the Navajo reservation you know I my grandmother always told me um that through the lens it would allow us to not only reflect on that moment but allow future family members to know who we are and my grandma always allowed me um you know, allowed me to, to express myself regardless of who I was, you know, whether that being an expression of feminine, feminine or masculine traits. Um, I, I, I take so much inspiration from her. Um, and uh, I use that, I, 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 I use that energy. Um, and it, it's, it's also created a a shield for me as as somebody who I look up to so much and um, you know moving forward uh, we have all this I grew up here on the reservation um, you know the landscapes play such a big part of um, who I am as an artist and being that I grew up around it here in Shiprock um, which I'm visiting um, here now uh, I live on the northern part of the town so there's a, there's a lot of uh, landscape, that, a lot of desert out north towards, um, going towards the Ute um, Reservation, which is Colorado borderline of, and New Mexico borderline. Um, I, have, I have photographed a lot there lately, um, you know, with this whole, with this whole movement of uh, photographers that are up and coming and there's so much going on right now the express the expressions of everybody are, are out there and uh, I want to commend everybody that has participated this year in this whole thing it, it means a lot um, and uh, there's so much to learn from this and learn from each other I um you know where I get my inspiration for photography is through not just from my family but you know experiences growing up uh, um, getting involved with my community uh, I went to music shows punk indigenous punk experimental shows and I met who are also artists today existing doing community work now and we all grew together in this and along the way I met other amazing individuals and I just continued to network throughout that time and um, with at the same time uh, getting older you kind of self-teach yourself 
I mean, I went to school for digital media and arts. I got my degree in that. And from there, I just, I just had the camera with me, um, a Canon 50 millimeter lens and started to, you know, go from shows to other events. And I started to work night jobs as a newspaper thrower to a, to a janitor. And last year that all changed when I wanted to take on my photography as an artist, as a visual artist full time. And my work got recognized slowly uh, within the past four years. And, you know, as I move forward, I take all in these experiences from HBO's work here. And uh, that, that just came organically through a direct message, a casting call, and therefore a, you know, I was on that show. I've, I've never done drag before. And one of the major images that is featured in the gallery, if we could do a screen share, um, is an image that really inspired the whole, uh, the whole way of paving um, where this is gonna go as far as beyond the feature. And it, it really sticks out to me as a black and white image of my friends. Um, it's, uh, it's called Our Home is Yours and it features from the left, uh, Lady Shiv, who is a non-binary drag performer. Um, and in the middle, the um, very amazing, my drag mother, Bob the Drag Queen, and on the right side, um, Danette Court um, clothing designer, Darren Tom. And uh, I really wanted to use this as a statement of, of, you know, reflecting, especially being confined in a space during isolation and the pandemic. I had all these images that I went through that I had that I didn't know if I wanted to share yet. And, I appreciated those moments so much and behind me as I was taking this photo there was probably about 90 people filming and trying to you know get b-roll and whatnot and you know that that was an amazing moment and it really you can see shiprock in the background and one of the next photographs that I, I really recognize is the um the next one to the right uh which is the uh, which is the home will always be there. Um, I took a I took a, a a visual of this with my Nikon um, D thirty thirty three I think thirty three hundred camera, and then I bought myself a new camera and I took this one with a sixty seven millimeter Canon eighty D, and the first one had a, had my friend DJ Beso, which means money in Navajo, and he's a, he's an, he's a musician. And this has my friend Mariah, who is single mom. And you know, I I I never thought I I found memory cards too. And part of this experience of just cleaning up self care and like getting organized with with who you are, what you want to do, like what what's going to happen? Because during the pandemic, I quit my job as a janitor. I took on my my photography full time and that was really up in the air because how am i going to be a photographer when i can't photograph people you know but you know do it outside maybe at a distance there were so many ways that i wanted to work around this and i wanted to help my community that's one of the reasons that drew me to wanted to be a photographer in the first place is how can i pick up my camera as a disabled person and give back. And this picture really inspires me. Every time I walk there, I always reflect on everything. And this was one of the images that really holds everything high and puts me in my place as an artist. I really want to um, move forward and take more landscape photos like this. and. Uh, you know, there's, there are pink sunsets, there are pink gradients. <laughs> I just really overcolorized this one, which was very beautiful and it under, it, it was really exposed. So I adjusted the settings a little with the refined belief tube version as opposed to the original. 
Um, so I want to move forward into the next image that I want to present. These collections are, this is a, a picture that I took, uh, if I could make a, uh, okay, this was, this was called No Holding Back. Um, I took this back in February and I started, you know, things were still, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how to navigate again because I was doing so much work behind the scenes that I didn't know how to exist as an artist. I, I still don't. And, you know, that's, there's, that's, there's nothing bad about that. But I have, I surrounded myself with a, with, with a group of people who I call my chosen family now. And one of the, one of the folks who I really, um, have been, you know, inspired by is Monica, and uh, she's an indigenous uh, athlete, and uh, she is she is here in the White Sands, uh, which is on Mescalero, Apache, and Tampa Choa lands. Um, it was an image that was supposed to be photographed with the with her standing up. And as we were, it was so windy and the clouds were forming above us and it looked like, I don't know, it just looked so atmospherically like creepy and like something was gonna take over because the sun was setting and the sand was blowing and my mask flew off. And it was just, it was chaotic. Uh, but when she fell forward, I said, spread your arms out. Like, just go with it, like let, let, what something is with stop action photography, what I what I um, learned is that anything goes and I, it's all about balancing your posture, especially when you have models in the subjects and taking working as a fashion photographer, learning about, um, you know, different kinds of poses from, you know, human figure arts. It's all it all comes in as as a, as an element to kind of have that in the back of my head as I'm photographing. And when you work well with somebody who takes photographs that they like to explore all sides of, you know, balancing their bodies in whatever environments, I really think that's just a challenging and beautiful thing. And executing this photo, I don't think there were many photos that were taken that evening because I'm, I, I'm not the photographer anymore that like, puts my shutter speed on high anymore as I used to, um, except if I'm photographing infants or toddlers, because I don't know if I'll, you know, make them cry or laugh at, the, at first. <laughs> so that's my biggest challenge still as a photographer. So um, yeah, uh, well, the next uh, photograph um, is of a special moment. I took on a project last year of working with the Transgender Resource Center here in Albuquerque. And um, the really great dear friend of mine, um, Melina, uh, asked me to be a part of the project as a photographer. And they wanted to, you know, bring a style because it was, the concept was the calendar uh, with tra all trans and non-binary folks and I wanted to, they wanted, they wanted to be more expression, body positive. And I, and I wanted that. And we, I wanted more inclusivity. I wanted more, um, I wanted more of how are, how are we going to navigate through this pandemic? How am I going to photograph these people? How am I going to photograph everybody in that space? And that was probably one of the most, I guess, business learning practices that I've learned, that I've, you know, experienced that, you know, it's allowed me to um, understand uh, boundaries and, and everything and making sure that, you know, everyone is safe and they're comfortable. Uh, but this photo, I mean, I, I took with Ramonda, who I call Long Last Family because I found out um the, during the shoot that we were related and through my mother's side and uh it was a it, it was a great moment on the west side of albuquerque there's a little place called the dunes which is near a, a truck racing track 
And uh, this was probably past the golden hour uh, in October, I believe, in 2020. And I put my, I put the flat, the florals, which are real florals behind her. And um, we lifted it up with a tripod and I kind of just executed by putting her in the front. Uh, and uh, she's, a, uh, she's an indigenous trans R&B songwriter. And, uh, and this, this photo is amazing. And I, I held my, my hand up with the flash on the left side and took the photograph at the same time, so kind of being my own lighting person during the pandemic was also a challenge. And yeah, that, that's, these are all in the gallery. Um, this one is really personal. Uh, I call it, I, I had this fallout with doing so much, feeling accomplished, and feeling emotional, feeling betrayed and because I put so much hard work into a company at one point and I've opened up to a lot of close family and friends about it and I moved forward from it. And I had a transparent conversation with the person themselves, but it also is a buildup of so much work, exhaustion, and um, I call it self palindrome because ironically it was the 21st, I, I, wanted, I don't wanna be so cliche, but I wanted it to, to mean something when I, when, I, when, I, when I went out to the Bistai by myself, I just didn't tell anybody where I wanted to go. And it, I call it the 21st photograph taken on the 21st, of January of the of 2021, um, and uh, I don't know how I got the inspiration to do this. I was literally naked in the in, out there, and I did not plan to really wear anything. But I had a leather jacket with me, and I always take a leather jacket, even as hot as it is right now, wherever I go, just because I feel safe, I feel brave, I feel like a badass. And um, just this whole structure of, of this whole texture of the landscape, it seems so hard to climb. I think of dark listed photography as a figure of speech, as a vanishing point. I think of it as me existing, coming out of my dark, my darkness to, to to be careful, but to allow other spaces to come in and create a safe space for everybody. I've, there's, it's like a figure of speech when somebody asks me, what, what does dark listed photography mean? So move, with that, well, moving forward, I, I, I wanted to present this in a 20, 24 by 24 on a canvas. I've never done can digital photography on canvas and that, that was amazing. I, I, it's in the gallery, it, it looks great. I, I, I think uh, the colors are beautiful and I miss my hair being that color, but it's a lot to take care of. <laughs> so um, I think that's all of the images. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, as I grew up, my mother always taught me to respect the areas we live in, to be considerate and to appreciate it as we grow up. Um, as I get older, I can see the changes from my youth and around the land here and everywhere else in the environment, it's, it's not safe. Um, I wanna create as many safe spaces as I can for everybody. And, you know, um, moving forward, I knowing what art is, separating that from product um, understanding what 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 my intentions are uh, those are those are all things to think about when you want to move forward and that allows you to I feel like that allows me to brainstorm more and figure out where I can go from there I think that's important and um, as a in closing I mean struggling as an artist it takes a lot of work and you know, um, 
building a network and surrounding yourself with great people. Um, sometimes you're alone in it. And that's, that's a process that, you know, you, had, you have to take some time to deal with. And uh, now it's, it's going great. I think for, for me, my, my future, the future, beyond the future right now, I think is to just take, take your, there's so much work that I've done that I just want to take my time now. I want to manifest all of this and move forward and enjoy more moments, capturing other folks. Uh, I just came back from this Indigenous Queer photo tour um, that I took last month at the same time doing this gallery installation. And I traveled with one of my great uh, friends who was also a queer indigenous photographer. We went from Albuquerque and took a road trip to Tulsa. Um, and then we went to, uh, we went from Tulsa to Minneapolis and then we flew to Seattle and we photographed all of these non-binary indigenous queer folks. And it was amazing. Like I had the best experience ever. And to set, to put that out there, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for what's to come next. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. And um, it's so great, so great to see everybody. And I really, I, you know, I appreciate everything. And I'm so grateful to be, you know, the artist featured and, you know, Jordan, Helen, um, Julia, thank you.